This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper. Author's Introduction. Quote, Breathes there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land. End quote. The author has often been asked if there were any foundation in real life for the delineation of the principal character in this book. He can give no clearer answer to the question than by laying before his readers a simple statement of the facts connected with its original publication. Many years since, the writer of this volume was at the residence of an illustrious man, who had been employed in various situations of high trust during the darkest days of the American Revolution. The discourse turned upon the effects which great political excitement produces on character, and the purifying consequences of a love of country, when that sentiment is powerfully and generally awakened in a people. He who, from his years, his services, and his knowledge of men, was best qualified to take the lead in such a conversation, was the principal speaker. After dealing on the marked manner in which the great struggle of the nation, during the war of 1775, had given a new and honorable direction to the thoughts and practices of multitudes whose time had formerly been engrossed by the most vulgar concerns of life, he illustrated his opinions by relating an anecdote, the truth of which he could attest as a personal witness. The dispute between England and the United States of America, though not strictly a family quarrel, had many of the features of a civil war. The people of the latter were never properly and constitutionally subject to the people of the former, but the inhabitants of both countries owed an allegiance to a common king. The Americans, as a nation, disavowed this allegiance, and the English, choosing to support their sovereign in the attempt to regain his power, most of the feelings of an internal struggle were involved in the conflict. A large proportion of the emigrants from Europe, then established in the colonies, took part with the crown, and there were many districts in which their influence, united to that of the Americans who refused to lay aside their allegiance, gave a decided preponderance to the royal cause. America was then too young, and too much in need of every heart and hand, to regard these partial divisions, small as they were in actual amount, with indifference. The evil was greatly increased by the activity of the English in profiting by these internal dissensions, and it became doubly serious when it was found that attempts were made to raise various corps of provincial troops, who were to be banded with those from Europe, to reduce the young republic to subjection. Congress named an especial and a secret committee, therefore, for the express purpose of defeating this object. Of this committee, Mr. Blank, the narrator of the anecdote, was chairman. In the discharge of the novel duties which now devolved on him, Mr. Blank had occasion to employ an agent, whose services differed but little from those of a common spy. This man, as will easily be understood, belonged to a condition in life which rendered him the least reluctant to appear in so equivocal a character. He was poor, ignorant, so far as the usual instruction was concerned, but cool, shrewd, and fearless by nature. It was his office to learn in what part of the country the agents of the crown were making their efforts to embody men, to repair to the place, enlist, appear zealous in the cause he affected to serve, and otherwise to get possession of as many of the secrets of the enemy as possible. The last he of course communicated to his employers who took all the means in their power to counteract the plans of the English, and frequently with success. It will readily be conceived that a service like this was attended with great personal hazard. In addition to the danger of discovery, there was the daily risk of falling into the hands of the Americans themselves, who invariably visited sins of this nature more severely on the natives of the country than on the Europeans who fell into their hands. In fact, the agent of Mr. Blank was several times arrested by the local authorities, and in one instance 
he was actually condemned by his exasperated countrymen to the gallows. Speedy and private orders to the jailer alone saved him from an ignominious death. He was permitted to escape, and this seeming and indeed actual peril was of great aid in supporting his assumed character among the English. By the Americans in his little sphere he was denounced as a bold and inveterate Tory. In this manner he continued to serve his country in secret, during the early years of the struggle, hourly environed by danger, and the constant subject of unmerited opprobrium. In the year blank, Mr. Blank was named to a high and honorable employment at a European court. Before vacating his seat in Congress, he reported to that body an outline of circumstances related, necessarily suppressing the name of his agent, and demanding an appropriation in behalf of a man who had been of so much use, at so great risk. A suitable sum was voted, and its delivery was confided to the chairman of the secret committee. Mr. Blank took the necessary means to summon his agent to a personal interview. They met in a wood at midnight. Here Mr. Blank complimented his companion on his fidelity and adroitness, explained the necessity of their communications being closed, and finally tendered the money. The other drew back, and declined receiving it. "'The country has need of all its means,' he said. "'As for myself, I can work or gain a livelihood in various ways.' Persuasion was useless, for patriotism was uppermost in the heart of this remarkable individual. And Mr. Blank departed, bearing with him the gold he had brought, and deep respect for the man who had so long hazarded his life unrequited for the cause they served in common. The writer is under an impression that, at a later day, the agent of Mr. Blank consented to receive a remuneration for what he had done but it was not until his country was entirely in a condition to bestow it. It is scarcely necessary to add that an anecdote like this, simply but forcibly told by one of its principal actors, made a deep impression on all who heard it. Many years later, circumstances which it is unnecessary to relate, and of an entirely adventitious nature, induced the writer to publish a novel, which proved to be what he little foresaw at the time, the first of a tolerably long series. The same adventitious causes which gave birth to the book determined its scene and its general character. The former was laid in a foreign country, and the latter embraced a crude effort to describe foreign manners. When this tale was published, it became matter of reproach among the author's friends that he, an American in heart as in birth, should give to the world a work which aided, perhaps, in some slight degree, to feed the imaginations of the young and unappreciated among his own countrymen, by pictures drawn from a state of society so different from that to which he belonged. The writer, while he knew how much of what he had done was purely accidental, felt the reproach to be one that, in a measure, was just. As the only atonement in his power, he determined to inflict a second book, whose subject should admit of no cavil, not only on the world, but on himself. He chose patriotism for his theme, and to those who read this introduction and the book itself, it is scarcely necessary to add that he took the hero of the anecdote, just related, as the best illustration of his subject. Since the original publication of The Spy, there have appeared several accounts of different persons who are supposed to have been in the author's mind while writing the book. As Mr. Blank did not mention the name of his agent, the writer never knew any more of his identity with this or that individual than has been here explained. Both Washington and Sir Henry Clinton had an unusual number of secret emissaries. In a war that partook so much of a domestic character, and in which the contending parties were people of the same blood and language, it could scarcely be otherwise. The style of the book has been revised by the author in this edition. In this respect he has endeavored to make it more worthy of the favor with which it has been received, though he is compelled to admit there are faults so interwoven with the structure of the tale that, as in the case of a decayed edifice, it would cost perhaps less to reconstruct than to repair. 
five and twenty years have been as ages with most things connected with America. Among other advantages, that of her literature has not been the least. So little was expected from the publication of an original work of this description at the time it was written, that the first volume of The Spy was actually printed several months before the author felt a sufficient inducement to write a line of the second. The efforts expended on a hopeless task are rarely worthy of him who makes them, however low it may be necessary to rate the standard of his general merit. One other anecdote connected with the history of this book may give the reader some idea of the hopes of an American author in the first quarter of the present century. As the second volume was slowly printing, from manuscript that was barely dry when it went into the compositor's hands, the publisher intimated that the work might grow to a length that would consume the profits. To set his mind at rest, the last chapter was actually written, printed, and paged several weeks before the chapters which preceded it were even thought of. This circumstance, while it cannot excuse, may serve to explain the manner in which the actors are hurried off the scene. A great change has come over the country since this book was originally written. The nation is passing from the gristle into the bone, and the common mind is beginning to keep even pace with the growth of the body politic. The march from Vera Cruz to Mexico was made under the orders of that gallant soldier who, a quarter of a century before, was mentioned with honor in the last chapter of this very book. Glorious as was that march, and brilliant as were its results in a military point of view, a stride was then made by the nation, in a moral sense, that has hastened it by an age, in its progress toward real independence and high political influence. The guns that filled the valley of the Aztecs with their thunder have been heard in echoes on the other side of the Atlantic, producing equally hope or apprehension. There is now no enemy to fear but the one that resides within. By accustoming ourselves to regard even the people as erring beings, and by using the restraints that wisdom has adduced from experience, there is much reason to hope that the same providence which has so well aided us in our infancy may continue to smile on our manhood. Cooperstown, March 29, 1849 End of Author's Introduction